Uh, well, hello, like, my name is Gonzalo Nunes. I'm a manager for KPMG Canada in the cyber practice. I've been working here in Canada for uh, since 2012 and always uh, been working in the uh, application security practice, like whether it's uh, assisting organizations with the uh, mirrors of testing on applications that need to be done, all the way down to reviewing programs, practices, uh, regarding DevOps, DevSecOps, or security, et cetera, right? Um, so anyway, uh, moving on. So um, I'm highlighting a province intro here because uh, this is one thing that uh, we wanted to, to consolidate in this presentation, which is essentially like we've been working here uh, as KPMG, assisting a um, myriad of clients, and we've always noticed that there are like struggles that uh, we encounter with these clients, right? Like they're trying to uh, implement solutions, they're trying to integrate their processes into like a whole like DevOps world, like whether it's that they're starting, they want to see what DevOps brings to the organization, all the way down to like they already have like pipelines defined, they have their controls in place, and they want to figure out what's the best strategy to, their, to reduce their mean time to recover, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, right? But here what we're trying to highlight is exactly these struggles. What, what does this mean? This means like why like we're seeing organizations that they're trying to implement DevOps, but they're having like issues and try to identify what the underlying problem is in those. Like, like Ravid mentioned, right, he highlighted right, uh, like of understanding of technology, um, getting hung up on the controls, but why? Why is that, right? So we'll start just by looking at where are we today. And uh, I'll just go over briefly. Um, Brian, I'll probably rely on you to let me know when to stop because like, I can talk a lot about this. Uh -huh. So anyway, um, so to start, right? Uh, where are we today? In terms of the technology as we've been measured, like technology is always accelerating, right? So technology is not a problem for DevOps. Like we have already solutions, for example, that treat everything as a code, like from configuration, infrastructure, your environment, and also your applications, obviously, right? Like if we think about like 10 years ago, when we would have said that we could have deployed servers like just by writing lines of code, right? That wasn't heard of at the time. Now it's a reality, right? So, and also whether those technologies uh, not exist, they will exist, right? Like you can see this with like, for example, Terraform, right? That is like trying to provide a standard um, language, or so standard really, but it's trying to provide uniformity across like multiple cloud providers, right? So technology is not a problem, right? And also something we want to highlight is uh, the focus of the DevSecOps or SecDevOps, uh, whatever. Um, so we're not, we want to highlight the focus, like what is it based out of, like the principles, right? We all know that for starters, DevOps, right, is the combination of the practices from development and infrastructure operations, right? But trying to combine those together, like what are the philosophies that come around it? And they, become, they come from the Agile Manifesto, right? That's the whole spirit of DevOps, right? To release the market faster, right? And we have like those four pillars, individual interactions, what's it? Individual interactions over um, processes and tools, working software over, com over comprehensive documentation, uh, documentation, customer collaboration versus uh, contract negotiation and responding to change uh, versus uh, responding to a, uh, acting to, uh, what's it? Following a plan, right? So I want you to remember these principles because we're gonna go over them uh, at the end of this presentation. Hopefully if we get with time. Okay, so what are we gonna talk today in particular is about real life scenarios that we participated on, that we've mentioned, okay? and we're gonna focus on three things. The perspective, like who we are on each scenario, the context, like what is going on in the scenario, and the argument, what is the rationale behind the things that are being said. So we'll start with the first scenario, right? Overwhelmed by controls. What is it? Like, we're gonna be looking at this scenario from the perspective of an infrastructure engineer in an agile environment, right? Our shop is like half DevOps, half traditional, right? We've done the migration of like different applications into a DevOps environment, uh, but we still have like some legacy systems, right? So in our DevOps shop, we make sure we have our pipelines, we have our controls in place, we made our due diligence, as infrastructure engineers that we're collecting the right things, right? And then all of a sudden, we have um, our risk team or our InfoSec team coming in and requesting to implement controls in a traditional way, right? And these are the arguments, right? Like, they need to implement the controls as they were previously. They need to see the same set of reports. They need to follow the same processes, right? What are these things? Let's look at them, right? 
For example, documentation and formalization of every process, including periodic reviews. What does this mean, right? Like, if you have your policy or your process, like, oh, you're gonna, like, and your procedure, right? Let's say, like, where you rely on Jira, and no, sorry, on Confluence, or any, any wiki solution, for the documentation of our procedures, right? And uh, we have people coming in and asking for, okay, like, who defined this uh, document? Who reviewed it? Who gave the approval? Where's the version history? Like, do you have a change control for this document? And at that point in time, like, that's not really agile, is it? All right. Now, next of all, segregation of duties, right? Uh, this is one key theme that every organization will have, right? Developers cannot push applications to production. And the problem here is, should they push to production or should they have access to production? Because those concepts, they get overlapped so often. Like, if I get every penny I've heard that, like, probably be rich. And um, testers versus peer reviewers. We are in an environment where, like, you have testers that are, um, sorry, um, that are test-driven development, meaning that developers develop the test alongside with the code, and then they get evaluated through the pipeline, right? Versus peer reviewers, peer, uh, people that review that the changes that are pushed to the pipeline are correct or not, right? Traditionally, in our environments, like we have a limited set of developers, so most of the time, like they do share the same roles. Meaning, a developer in some times, uh, or the tester in this case, like the person that developed the test, obviously, will be a peer reviewer. And they're saying here in this scenario that no, this is not the case. They should be. Uh, there should be a separate group that should be the one that be doing the peer reviews. Why is that? All right. Next, a vulnerability patch and configuration. This, um, this InfoSec group is looking at vulnerability management. From the traditional angle, we just want to scan all the assets that are out there in our environment. We need to report on these assets, but we have a DevOps environment, right? We have a myriad of uh, instances that get like spun up dynamically. You'll encounter that there are issues that like one IP at one point in time may be a virtual machine for Windows, and then the next day it will be a Linux box, right? So that's a complete different uh, picture. But the, obviously, they want the reports in a traditional manner and so forth, right? And asset inventory registration. They want to know at any point in time uh, that those machines, w what they are, and they want to enroll in their traditional asset uh, inventory. If you're dealing with cloud solutions, that's a bit insane, right? Like, you need to focus that particular problem in a different approach, right? So now, let's look at how to address those issues, right? So to begin with, like, in this particular case, what should have been done, right, from the very beginning, right? Like, we've seen that InfoSec, uh, the InfoSec team, or the RISC team, like, came in all of a sudden, like, after the implementation was done, just to say, okay, we need controls. Why weren't they involved to begin with, right? Where was their initiative to interact? Did we call them out, like, when we were implementing all of these controls? Like, what happened, right? And you may think, no, that's impossible. Like, information security will always be there. We'll always monitor these initiatives and practices. Truth is, like many organizations have actually come to that scenario because InfoSec wasn't looking at that particular project like that was bringing DevOps to the organization or the risk team, uh, conversely, right? Now, for that's the start, like the overall problem. Now, the next one, document in an agile way, right? We're talking about procedures, right? Procedures don't need to be that formal depending on the organization. Like, how fast do you want your documentation to be? You need enough documentation to follow your processes uh, appropriately, but you don't need over comprehensive documentation, right? You probably don't need to have these documents reviewed by your director and then approved, vetoed, and then submitted, right? At that point in time, they, they truly become a Word document. They just exist in a compliance page. All right, segregation of duties. How do you solve segregation of duties in a DevOps environment? Just automate the hell out of it, right? Just try to ensure that no one touches your environment. Just try to do all the automated tests at uh, early stages in your development process, like as well as shift left, right? That way, no one will actually tell you, okay, like you have a segregation of duties problem, right? And now moving on, to last like vulnerability management and uh, asset management. What we have here is okay. What do you patch? Like Praveen did mention this. So you have your instances, right? Whether you're dealing with Kubernetes containers or you're dealing with virtual machines, right? 
if you have a golden image, well, your focus should be patching that golden image that gets deployed every time. And just make sure that you renew your entire environment, meaning you destroy everything and you build it up again uh, every so often to make sure that everything is up to date, right? And you make sure that once you get deployed, you have some sort of configuration monitoring, monitoring tool to ensure that there is no deviation, meaning that uh, for some reason your configuration changed, you can detect that, right? As well, asset registration, right? There are multiple products out there that actually provide you monitoring capabilities on what you have in your environment, especially when we're dealing with cloud environments, right? Like how many products have come out that can give you like even diagrams of the solution of your entire asset uh, in AWS, in Azure, or in GCP, for example, right? Google. Right. So that's our first scenario. You can see that there are like some key themes that Praveen has mentioned here before, and we'll probably hear them again in a different context. So moving on, um, next scenario, this control is not valid. And literally like this quote that I, that I actually got told this quote, like, dude, trust me, this will never happen. Like it's, it's impossible. Like I have this control, it's proper, like it's not gonna happen. So what is the scenario? So in this scenario, uh, we're gonna look at it from the perspective of an risk team analyst. Now we're gonna flip the board. We're gonna look at the risk team performing a review of the different roles and accesses in place in, in our DevOps uh, environment, right? Um, while doing this review, we identified that developers had direct access to production and they were able to, um, to, to bypass all the automated controls and just lo log into the servers to do like supporting tool, uh, supporting activities. What was the argument that was given to us? That developers needed this access to actually troubleshoot applications, meaning that they required this access to like uh, fix the deployments that were not working right, uh, make changes to databases, uh, and it wasn't an, and it was a non-issue. But why is that, right? That actually opened up a uh, kind of worms because you realize, wait a minute, like developer, like why are we failing? Why are deployments are failing in such a way that we have to go back in and actually tinker with things manually? So like I said, it opened a kind of worm. So we ended up back going to the actual review and we looked at, uh, well, first of all, let's look at what are the current processes that are in place. So we have our development, we have our DevOps environment, we're relying in containers, meaning that we're using like Kubernetes to deploy container images like Lightweight that support our services. And we have our pipelines well established to deploy all the way to production in an automated manner, meaning they execute the tests, like whether they're unit, security, quality, et cetera, right? Code quality, et cetera, right? So okay, but we still need to know why our tests are failing, why like there are so many bugs that end up in production, right? We look around and we figure out that the tests that were developed were like super lightweight, that they were always going to pass. And also that the security scans that were executed or code quality checks as well, like SonarQ for example, they weren't failing the bills, like everything was going through, right? So with that process that has been established, like obviously you're gonna see that there are, go there are going to be issues that may end up in production, right? There is no reason why, like for example, like your unit test, right? To make sure that you're having like a good code that's going into production, like where's your test driven development in this case, right? So in this case, from a security perspective or a risk perspective, right? Having access to production is completely different than having the rights to deploy to production, meaning if you wanna give rights to the developers to push applications to production, fair enough, you can do so. But no one should be accessing production directly. And if you're going to troubleshoot, make sure uh, there's a separate role that does the troubleshooting. This may lead into like, the context of what development-driven DevOps versus operations-driven DevOps is, but quite sure Arani will touch that subject later. Um, so anyway, moving on. Um, Data is sensitive within production, right? Adding another rationale on why people shouldn't be accessing production directly, right? So what can we do here in this instance? We have to strengthen our tests, right? Like we have to make sure that our tests are proper before sending them through the pipeline. So perhaps we need to do a review 
of the, the tests that are in our applications, right? Perhaps like prioritizing them, like having the critical applications being reviewed first, but we need to make sure that at least we have tests that they go through our pipelines correctly, right? And next one, um, automated deployment. Yeah, like just enforce that, right? Like deployment is automated. No one should be accessing production directly. Okay. Um, next. Okay. So I'm just going to wrap this one up uh, with this case, like no audit plan. This is a very interesting case because I loved it. I saw it like all the way through how it unraveled and uh, it ended up in a litigation process, which was hilarious to see happening. Anyway. So in this case, we're going to be the infrastructure engineer again. Like we're going to be in an organization that has a well-developed uh, DevOps practice, secure DevOps practice in this case, right? We have like, all the controls. We know what we're doing. We have security on board. We know that we have the appropriate set of controls. Then internal audit comes in and performs a review based on an outdated program for the platform that we're reviewing. In this case, it was AWS. And, and there was no clarity on the technology of the scope of the review. And the audit argument was that they were capable of defining the scope, the sign of the audit, and then report based on that independently. But the problem here is that if you start with an outdated program plan, outdated audit program plan, then what do you think is going to happen, right? At this point in time, we realized that audit wasn't listening to our um, to infrastructure engineers in this case. So what ended up happening? We ended up with issues that were related to outdated configuration or deprecated configuration settings, right? Like issues as, like these settings are no longer used, they've been deprecated. They run like security scripts that were like from 2014 in 2019. Obviously, they're going to fail. So you're going to see a lot of errors that are going to be reported, right? Then in addition to that, there were issues related that lie beyond the scope of the audit, right? infrastructure that was no longer in use was being reported because audit didn't have enough context to understand what were the solutions. You already had applications that were old, deprecated, and then you tried to report that into the audit, right? And then on top of that, like issues were found to be overinflated. And this was uh, one of the contention points because at this point in time, the audit team identified that there was no evidence for to prove that there was a breach, but there was no evidence to prove that it w there wasn't. So they ended up saying so there was a breach, which really, like, if, if we all think about it, that's you can't report something based on the fact that you cannot prove it, right? So things to consider really here, right? DevOps, DevSecOps, whatever, should guide internal audit on this. Like, they should, like, there should be an established person that says, like, okay, we're gonna do an audit. Let's at least talk together. Right? Let's at least do something together, right? Like, let's define what the scope should be together, right? You have ruling on say what is in scope, what's not, but at least listen to me, right? And audit should be willing to listen to DevOps, right? And also audit should be willing to embrace the new technologies in use, right? Like there are, because you have different technologies, you have different approaches on how to test different controls, right? And that may change the way you test things, right? So I'm gonna skip over this one because we don't have time, and just gonna go over to the conclusion, like on these three scenarios that we've seen so far, right? What it comes down to really, like we've seen that we have problems with controls, with definition, we have problems with integration. So what is it at the very end? It's just communication. We all need to talk um, to each other. So what we said like in the four uh, pillars of the Agile Manifesto, like one of them was people and interaction over processes and tools. So because we're gonna have to interact with people every so often, then yeah, we're gonna have to be dealing with communication problems, right? Like people willing to listen to each other. So for example, for security, right? Like security should be telling us, they like should be communicating to us what is relevant to them. Like what are the security requirements that need to be defined in our application? Just gonna go over this quickly. Like for example, for compliance, right? They need to embrace these new technologies as we mentioned, right? Like have a sound strategy, listen to DevOps to have that strategy. And last but not least, DevOps, what the DevOps team should do. Lead by example, right? DevOps needs to explain the technologies, needs to teach them. They shouldn't bypass them, they shouldn't fool the other teams. And also listen, right? Like understand what the risks are for the organization too. Uh, as developers, I'm also, I was also a developer long ago. Like I was just trying to make things work and 
that may mean that uh, I can bypass some security controls just because it doesn't make my program work, right? But that shouldn't be the case. We should be listening. And I think I'm one. And I think that's uh, pretty much it for this discussion. Hope it was uh, very interesting to you. Then again, like if we're talking here, listening to these problems, you probably heard them before. You'll probably hear them again. It's just about communication, really. Thank you very much.